Hello, hello. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, we are here live for episode two of our Girl Develop It podcast, and I'm excited. Uh, hopefully, all is well with the audio. Everybody can hear me live. Let me know uh, what you're working on today in the chat, wherever you're joining from. But, you know, welcome again, everybody. Like I said, um, we're here for episode two, and um I thought that I could continue on with where we started out from the last episode because, you know, I really wanted to give a foundational, I guess, um, round of materials before we start digging, diving deeper into some specific topics. And so um, last episode, we talked about the importance of, you know, um, the different types of disciplines you could possibly focus on in tech, not just software development in particular, and kind of a description of what those different types of roles look like. And so that was part one of getting started in tech. And part two of getting started of tech, I thought it would be really good to just talk about um, what are the tools and maybe like um, I was trying to think of a way to describe it. Like, it's not, it's like tools, technologies, like kind of what are those foundational things that you should get started with and get set up for yourself, even if you're early on in your journey, just so that you can help, um, you know, really maximize how you're growing yourself as a developer over time. And so I have about, I have at least eight different topics that we can cover today. So um, I'm going to talk about those and kind of give you a little bit of um, ideas of how you can get started in those different areas. And then, of course, you know, we'll always have time in the future to deep dive, or we have a lot of different courses with Girl Develop It, where you can learn a lot of these materials as well. So yeah, um, again, if you have not met me before, my name is Jessica Vaughn. I also go by Meta Dev Girl online. And, um, you know, I obviously am hosting this show. But of course, as I mentioned before, I am a you know, a board member with Girl Develop It. I have been with the organization pretty much the entire time that I've been um, even venturing into software development. So I'm definitely coming at this from the perspective of someone that has gone through, you know, learning uh, from scratch, learning from resources online and things like that. Um, someone that has uh, did eventually also take a boot camp um, and also somebody who, you know, along my journey, I've also taught. So I still teach and still help people transition into tech. So that's the main thing that I really want to um, the background I want to give everyone because, you know, I'm thinking about this from both sides of the spectrum. And a little of this is things that I am happy that I did early on or things that maybe I could have done better early on or didn't even realize how crucial some of the things I did early on actually play a big part in how I was able to, I think, advance really efficiently through, um, transitioning into tech and, um, you know, I found a lot of fulfillment and meaning in it. So I hope that this advice can be helpful for you all. So again, like getting started in tech part two, this is the foundational tools to kickstart your tech career. So um, the first thing I want to start with is GitHub. Um, I'm, we probably have talked about this at some point. If not, we will we will talk about GitHub a lot. Um, GitHub is really a, a crucial tool for developers in particular. And of course, with Girl Develop It, you know, we the majority of people that are learning from us are actually looking to get into development in some type of way, whether it's front end or back end. Um, or, you know, the myriad in between. And so GitHub is definitely a crucial part of that. Um, like I always tell people that I happened to learn GitHub very early on, even before I took a boot camp, before I did anything else. I took like a web development workshop. And even though it, was, it wasn't a super in-depth workshop, it wasn't really designed to help you become, you know, a software developer or anything, but it was like, you know, the fundamentals of web development at the time. And my instructor, I remember he really pushed, um, teaching us how to get started with Git and GitHub. And I think I'm probably the only person that was in that class who even tried to use it, um, but I did. And I it, just, it was those little bite-sized moments of kind of like taking on 
um, small pieces of what I could understand about Git and incrementally building my knowledge over time. That makes me feel comfortable with it. And that also made me feel really comfortable with it by the time I was moving on to software teams and working with a lot of other folks uh, using GitHub and Git. So um, even though you you might not know exactly how to use the version control system just yet, it really is something that you should pay attention to early on alongside your language. And so I would say, you know, to create a GitHub account and um, to kind of maximize your profile on there. And so there's a lot that I could cover on there. A couple notable features with GitHub is that they do have the ability to um, add like a read me as they would call it, um, a basically a, a text profile onto your main um, profile page. And so that is really nice because that's a newer feature. And now that means that whenever somebody comes to your uh, GitHub profile, they can immediately see, oh, this is, you know, um, all the things that, you know, it's kind of like having that description or that opening statement on your LinkedIn, you know, you could say, what kind of things are you working on? What kind of things do you like to learn? Um, you could tell people how to get in contact with you. You can make, um, you know, references and highlight other projects or other things that you might be working on that doesn't necessarily live, you know, in a code base. And so that's something I've been polishing up recently and I will be re, um I will be sharing some more resources on how to do that and um, I'm going to talk about it at the end of this episode but in June we will be doing our career explorations event and as a part of that one of the presentations that um, I'll be giving is leveraging uh, Git and GitHub for your technical portfolio right so there is the uh, aspect of just kind of being able to see the code um, that you're working on, you know, for any potential um, any potential companies that's interested in you. But then GitHub also has a few features like um, being able to host a static website that, you know, can be, you know, your landing page for your visual portfolio. Um, and I think those are the main two. Um, you you have the ability to launch a landing page on your GitHub profile. It'll be hosted for you and everything. And then you also have the ability to actually maximize and kind of like customize out your profile so you can tell people more about you when they come to your page. Um, and the last thing on GitHub is that you have something called pins. And as you are you know, working on different projects, if there are specific projects in your uh, list of repositories that you really want people to be paying attention to, right? Because sometimes we have actual projects and sometimes we have like just little side stuff or experimental things that we're working on. So you really want to kind of focus people's attention and say, hey, these are the top, you know, one to six uh, repositories that I recommend, you know, you look at or that you are, you know, pushing people's eyes towards when they come to your portfolio. So um, like I said, I have a lot more resources to share on that. And I will be giving a presentation on how you can leverage your Git and GitHub profile uh, on June 7th as a part of our career explorations event. So I'll talk more about that at the end and um, happy to always answer questions. If there are things as I'm going along, things that you think about that you have questions about or that we could expand upon, definitely leave a comment or let me know because um, that'll give me some insight as to some of the other future episodes or um, future resources that we can provide as well. So number one, your GitHub account. Number two is your portfolio. And now this is a little, this word can mean multiple things, I would say, just because um, if you're a front end developer, for example, then it's pretty evident like, you know, your portfolio would usually include actual web applications um, or actual, you know, web websites that you have built um, so that someone can visually actually see, you know, your work um, in, in IRL. But when it comes to like Maybe you're a back-end developer or, um, you know, you could you, you might write APIs or you do, you do something that doesn't necessarily have a UI to it or a user interface to it. Um, there's other ways that you can still showcase your work. So um, 
GitHub might do be double duty for you in this way because you might use GitHub and just highlight uh, different code bases that you um, think are important. But you could also use things like repelit.com or CodePen. Um, these are sites that you might be able to like build out small demos um, and kind of showcase them that way. So that's definitely an option. And then like um, there is design, more design-based platforms as well. So um, here I just have a couple like Behance, Dribble, Replit.com or CodePen. Um, so the, the main goal of the portfolio is to demonstrate your skills and showcase the projects that you have worked on. So um, this would be a place where whenever someone lands on it, like it could be a personal website, um, it would include like a list of the different projects, um, the different technologies and, um, you know, tools that you used, maybe um, just to highlight exactly what your skill set is for those individual projects. Um and then more about you as well, you know, like this could also include a blog um, if you want to write about technical content as a part of kind of showcasing your knowledge, then um, that would definitely fall under this category as well. So for me, the way I have it is like I have a personal website, which is in the past, it has been just the GitHub account that I have hosted um, through them. It, it has also been a site that I fully completely hosted myself. Um, but at this point in time, my, my portfolio site, quote unquote, my personal website is um, mostly running on top of a blogging platform. So that's the main thing that I'm trying to showcase through that avenue is more technical content, more you know, educational content, because that that's very specific to, to me, and uh, also specific to um, the type of skill set that I want to showcase, you know. Um, and then I have GitHub, where obviously I can point out specific projects. Um, and I do a little bit of a different thing with GitHub, too, because n a, especially right now, not a lot of my highlighted projects are actually talking about more technical expertise. Like, it's not projects I've built so much as it is educational materials that I am creating um, that I share through GitHub. But it, either way, you know, I, I'm able to show code on GitHub and I'm able to um, have more of the blog and educational content and actually kind of use my personal website to pull in all of the different things that I'm working on across other organizations and things like that. So I, I, I let my website, I'm trying to kind of get back to a point where that is like the central place um, to find everything about everything when it comes to, um, you know, the different projects I work on and the different organizations that I support. And it's always a work in progress, you know. So um, the biggest concern I always have as an instructor is, especially when I'm working with a boot camp, um, I really get concerned for students who um, we typically will tell you to start working on your portfolio early on and get in GitHub is like going to be one of the first things you learn how to do. But then I don't. I'll, I'll see the encouragement of students to literally start your portfolio immediately, but I won't, I'll get to the end of the program and so many people haven't even like done anything towards the portfolio. And to me, that's like, I, I don't think it's a good um, precedence to set for yourself <laughs> if you're not thinking about your portfolio, because especially if you're transitioning, right? At the end of the day, the way that you showcase your expertise, what makes it possible to just go to a boot camp and then come out and be able to get a job is that you have a portfolio of work. Somebody can see this is what this person is capable of doing this. And even when you are, you know, um, continuing to document your work over time, you can even show growth as you know, you gain technical expertise as well. So, um, you know, it, it does stress me out sometimes. And I'm like, I, I tell students like, okay, just start your portfolio. And I'll even try to do other ways to encourage people to at least do a little something here and there, you know. Now, whenever you are building any type of 
um, exercises, labs, things like that, then you can actually bring some of those um, pieces that you really want to highlight into your portfolio. Um, and, you know, so you kind of set up a basic portfolio for yourself and then you can just add your projects as you go along and you can always implement, I mean, iterate and get better. You can always iterate and get better. Um, I feel like what I have seen is that um, another part of what delays people in starting their portfolio is just feeling like you don't know enough or um, feeling like you want you have all these lofty ideas um, and your portfolio as a project ends up taking a back seat to all the other things that you're learning and doing and um, all the other projects that you're working on. So make it simple for yourself, okay? So this is another area that I would definitely definitely be covering with the um, leveraging Get and GitHub for your technical, technical portfolio because it is an easy way to actually go ahead and um, set up, you know, a website for yourself and have it hosted through GitHub and have it, you know, easy to track and easy to manage. Um, so we can talk about some tips there, but that's number two, which is your portfolio. So we have your GitHub account um, as number one and your portfolio as number two. So number three is LinkedIn, LinkedIn, LinkedIn. Um, and a lot of people are even watching on LinkedIn, watch these shows live on LinkedIn, you know, and the beauty of LinkedIn is um, it has been like this for quite some time now, you know, of course we live in a digital age, I think even more so in the last few years, um, increasingly so, and having your updated LinkedIn profile is so crucial. That is, um, key to having like, you know, polish. Now I look at your LinkedIn profile more as a, a, a resume, um, and GitHub a little bit more as a portfolio, but it, you know, they kind of overlap each other. Another thing about LinkedIn though, is just the networking side of things, keeping up with what's going on in your industry and definitely the job opportunities. Because for me, I know that I started with LinkedIn, I think even if I wasn't using it like I should have, by the time I started my boot camp, um, I definitely had to have a LinkedIn profile and everything. So, um, but I do feel like over the years, I didn't utilize it as much as I could, right? So when you start to actually put all the information and skills and um, even link to projects and things on your LinkedIn profile, then you can have recruiters that are actually searching for candidates find your um, profile and reach out to you as well. So um, I think that's the turning point for a lot of people when you go from your LinkedIn profile is like a ghost town to you actually have recruiters reaching out to you, which means you're probably coming up in their searches um, one way or another, which can be a good thing because it's good to have opportunities coming to you um, and expand out the list of things that, you know, you can consider versus uh, that world where you're like, oh my goodness, I'm searching, I'm searching, I'm searching, I'm applying, I'm applying, I'm applying, and I never hear back. Um, so there's a lot that could be said there. Um, another topic that I wanted to highlight is that, again, as a part of our career explorations event that is happening next month in June, there is going to be a presentation on optimizing your LinkedIn profiles as well. So again, I'll talk about that at the end of the episode. But LinkedIn is definitely uh, crucial. So if you're not already taking advantage of it, you know, keep your LinkedIn up to date. Um, get a good like headshot or, or picture that is appropriate. But also, I think it's it's OK to show your personality in your LinkedIn profile, especially depending on what kind of avenue you want to be into. Like, you know, for me, you're going to see like. I, my, my, I think my, my headshot right now, I have like space buns and I, my braids are like the color of a uh, Harley Quinn hair. So it's like, but that's me as a person, you know? So I think that that is a uh, part of my, um, my uniqueness that I want to show. So I don't just like use the traditional, you know, headshot with a button up and all this other kind of stuff. Um, but that's me. And so, uh, yeah, so LinkedIn, LinkedIn is like under, 
appreciate it in the beginning because it's hard to really see the value in it until you're actually kind of in the thick of it. So making connections with people, remembering where those connections came from. Like, you know, if you met people at events or you saw them do a, a talk or um, you used to work together. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think of other things that that comes to mind when it comes to LinkedIn. Again, these are all topics that we, <laughs> it, these are rabbit holes that you can go down. But in the beginning, right, you, you might not have very much set up on your LinkedIn profile. That's okay. Make sure that you set it up and make sure that you know, over time you are keeping it updated. And then LinkedIn, again, is a great platform to find out about industry news. Um, and the job searches, like I think at this point in my in my career, I don't even look very many other places besides LinkedIn for jobs. Um, I usually find anything that I'm applying to through LinkedIn. And that's not just looking at direct job postings. That's also looking at you know, other people that I have worked with or um, have, you know, been in groups with or whatever, who might say, hey, my company is hiring or, hey, I just got this opportunity with this company and um, those referrals and things like that. I find a, pretty much anything that I have wanted to do, I've found those opportunities through um, LinkedIn and other kinds of networking. So number three is LinkedIn. And then in a similar vein of networking, but obviously we are in a world where we are getting back to doing a lot of things in person. And so I want to bring us back to the idea of number four, which is meetups and user groups. So when I was first starting out, um, I worked at a coding boot camp, right? Like the company I worked for ran coding boot camps. And even before I was getting into programming, I actually was the person who would um, be the, the 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 organization, like host the organizations. I would host. I was the host for all the meetups. Um, so whenever a meetup group would be looking for space, they would come to us typically because you know we were known in the tech space. So they would come to us and say, "Hey, can we host our you know our." weekly event here, our monthly event here? Um, can we host our workshop here? And so I was that person that was working directly with all of these different meetup organizers to help them organize their events. I was the person who was welcoming everyone to, you know, the location and telling them more about what we did um, outside of those meetup groups, um, because it was a good opportunity, you know, for us to connect with the tech community and the individuals in the tech community. So that is kind of how I got exposed to meetups, um, just being an event host for them. And then eventually, as I started to dig into tech, I started to join meetups and how I joined Girl Develop It. If you've been around long enough, Girl Develop It start like we were meetups. Like we still have meetup or um, chapters and everything. Like we still have um, profiles on meetup, but we were in-person chapters, right? And we all had meetup groups. So um, Girl Develop It was probably the first meetup group that I was an organizer for and a leader for. And that went a long way. Uh, over time, it became, uh, I think, a good exposure point for me because I there was a lot of people who... I met or who knew about me just because I was a meetup organizer and basically I was a leader in the tech community. So, you know, in the beginning, you just kind of start out going to meetups, going to user groups, um, looking for workshops and events that are interesting to you, even if it's a technology that you haven't used before, especially if it's a technology that you haven't used before, but you are trying to learn how. I recommend going to those meetups, those user groups. And, um, you know, in the beginning, it was a lot of stuff I went to. I was like, uh, I, I didn't know exactly what was going on as far as like a lot of the, some of the content, but it still was an opportunity to get exposure. So it helped me, you know, figure out the types of things to look into and, and learn about and see what is it that everybody else in the industry is actually trying to do? What are the skills that they are they are trying to learn? Um. So when I say user groups, I typically am thinking about 
specifically like languages, for example, or technical tools. So for like a Java user group, I was a part of our local Java user group because I was learning and writing Java at the time. Um, or JavaScript user group, you know, so there's usually a lot of language specific groups. Um, there can also be groups for, you know, say like a UX um, group or something like that. So um, those are great opportunities. And you want to get to know people, you know, um, it, it we do live in a, a more remote world nowadays, but still like um, you know, I'm very active in the Detroit tech community. This is my home. This is where I grew up. I was born here. Um, so I have a lot of emotional attachment to just supporting the growth that we have here in Detroit. But at the same time, even if I got up and moved to, you know, California right now and I went to the Bay, I'm going to try to connect with the community. You know, uh, you, you don't really want to be in a silo. Um, that. I think there is like this concept in tech, like, oh, you just put your headphones on and then you just put your head down and start coding. And it's like, it's not a, a isolated feel like it, like it comes across, um, I think. And so, like I said, there's lots of opportunities. You, you want to have other people to talk to other people to learn from other people to teach, um, mentorship and all of that good stuff. So meetups and user groups are definitely serving in that community aspect of things. Um, and there's another one, which I'll talk about under tools. Let me see. I'll talk about communication platforms now, actually. Um, so number one, GitHub account. Number two, portfolio. Number three, LinkedIn profile. Number four, meetups and user groups. Um, then I would say number five is the communication platforms. So I'm going to make this number five because I will be having this as a part of the show notes. Okay. So number five is the communication platforms and Slack is usually the big one has been the big one for a really long time. However, Discord is also very, very popular. And a lot of groups are actually using Discord rather than Slack. However, for the most part, I out of any places that I've worked or seen, Slack is usually the um, work chat. So a lot of companies have a Slack organization and within, you know, the Slack channel, that would be where all of the different folks that work for the organization can kind of divide up in different, um, in different like topic channels. And um, you can have channels for your teams, you can do direct messages and things. So it's really like, it definitely serves as a, um, as a work chat. But a lot of our tech communities, a lot of us actually started out building our like online um, communities with Slack. So, for example, with Girl Develop It, we still use Slack. Um, however, for like my live streams and um, a lot of the stuff that I do personally, you know, for Meta Dev Girl and the Nerdsery, which I have, um, I have a Discord channel. Um, so you can, you could come across either, or I think at this point you probably need Slack and Discord to be quite honest. Um, depending like if you're doing the things that I'm saying, because one thing I have noticed is although Slack has still, um, kind of been consistent as a work chat, some of the community groups that used to have Slacks have moved over to Discord and there, you know, it, it actually serves really nicely as a community platform. So for Discord, for example, AI and machine learning is my area of um, study right now. And so when I go to look for those user groups, like I was talking about, um, they don't have Slack channels anymore. <laughs> they actually maintain Discord channels now or Discord servers now. So both of those are similar tools, but um, you'll probably see you'll probably see both of them, to be quite honest, if you're doing anything in tech um, and you can join different groups, find different groups to join as well. So, for example, like if you know of a particular language or a specific framework or something like that that you're interested in and you want to find their like virtual community, they probably have a Discord or Slack somewhere that you can join. So you can kind of look into those. 
So that's going to be the communication platforms. Um, let's go back. What's number six? Okay. So number six is your local development environment. Um, yeah. So a lot of times when we start, I'm saying we as in a, a teacher who does do like introductory workshops, a lot of times we'll start you out with something like repolit.com or CodePen or um, I can't even think of all of all of the different tools where you can basically code in your browser. And that is nice and accessible in the beginning. However, you do need to start investing if you know that you're you're transitioning right and you're this is a this is where this is the route that you're taking, then that's when you want to start investing in setting up your local development environment. Um, so like for example, if you take a boot camp, then there's probably you probably get information in your pre-work uh, for your boot camp about the different tools that you need to set up for your software stack and um, maybe even some resources on how to do that. But yes, the local development environment is important. So this is basically the idea of making sure that you can write and run code on your own computer. Um, we'll usually say like a local machine. So that's why I say local development is your local machine, your 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 computer, your hardware that is like <laughs> directly um, accessible to you. And so, yeah, uh, Git, setting up Git is definitely one of those avenues when it comes to your local development environment. But for example, if you do backend development, then you probably have to have some type of server um, that can actually run and execute the code. Um, so, you know, it depends on the actual tools that you're trying to learn. For example, if you're doing a full stack JavaScript, um, if you're doing a MERN stack, um, M-E-R-N, then you're going to want to have like a JavaScript setup, but also Node.js setup, um, Node, N-O-D-E, and also... Um, NPM, the note package manager. So there's some specific tools that you would want to have installed on your computer for those environments. So um, I definitely would love to cover that in, a, in another um, resource maybe. Uh, so look out for more information about that. Um, but yes, local development environment is important. Let me see. Okay. So the next one, which is related to your local development environment. So number six is your local development environment. Number seven is your code editor, which is a part of your local development, but it's less of the different tools um, and being able to run the code. It's more of being able to write the code. So your code editor is like, is literally your, your closest friend as a as a developer especially because again whenever you are writing code you sh you are typically going to be using a code editor so some of those other platforms you might have used before like a repolit.com or um why can't i think of the one for javascript it's it's one that we used a lot for for javascript in particular um or code pen or whatever those let you run those let you write and run your code in the browser but you want to be able to write your code, obviously, on your computer. So, um, a lot of a lot of languages, common languages, you can start out with something like Visual Studio Code, which is free to use and um, has a lot of different language supports in it. So you could uh, use Visual Studio Code. In the past, Atom and Sublime Text have also been popular as well, although I think Atom, A-T-O-M, got sunset. So um, Sublime Text is still available, though. Um, but Visual Studio Code is probably the one that is the most popular as just like a, gen a general IDE. Um, and then there are language-specific IDEs that you could potentially get into in the future. But um, if you're just starting out, Visual Studio Code is a great place to start. And um, the code editors, the the not just being able to write your code, but there are certain types of um, features that they offer, right? So something called syntax highlighting, where when you're writing your code, um, the editor can uh, color code 
your code just based off of the language that you're using. The um the editor can also give you feedback like um underlining things in squigglies if it is like you you misspelled something or you use something wrong or you 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 know you're missing you missed a step or something like that it can potentially pick up um the the syntax errors or the the structural errors in your code and there's a lot of other features um so co-editor i would say this is also known as the ide right integrated developer environment so um highly recommend vs code as a place to start and uh you you might also hear about like um what do, what do we use like different jet brains tools um and then like if you're a ios developer then you want to have um, Xcode, you know, because that's pretty specific to iOS development. Um, and, and they kind of give you direction in, in that area. But most web development, software development is you can start with something like uh, VS Code. And then number eight. So number one was GitHub account. Number two was your portfolio. Number three was your LinkedIn profile. Number four are the meetups and user groups. Number five is the communication platform. So that includes Slack and Discord. Number six is your local development environment, right? So those specific tools you need to run code on your computer. Number seven is your code editor or your IDE, which is how you will write code on your computer. And then number eight are your learning resources. Um, so, you know, It'll be a combination of tutorials and videos, different courses. Um, and as, if you go through a dedicated program, um, all of those kind of come together as your learning resources. And it is good to know what style works best for you because there's you could pretty much learn from all different media forms at this point, I would say. So you have your traditional books still. You have your um, blogs and articles. You have your YouTube videos. You have your, not just um, like uh, with videos, you have not just the edited produced content, right? The, the tutorial that has you know, it's just very like edited and it has a straightforward process that you can follow. But you also have other forms like longer courses that you can follow along with um, projects that you can follow along with. Or even like for me, I live stream things that I'm learning. So if you ever watch my live coding, it's not going to be me trying to teach you how to do something. It's going to literally like you'll literally be watching how I go through my process. So that is another form that I think did not exist when I was first starting out. And I think that all of those different mediums are helpful in different ways, right? So it's one thing to be like, okay, show me in 10 minutes, like, high level, how am I going to put this together? But in reality, it's not going to take no 10 minutes. It's, it's probably going to take 10 times whatever <laughs> that that quick tutorial was because there's other things that, you know, those tutorials are, are practiced and edited and rehearsed. Even your teachers, like uh, when we teach, like we, we practice our labs, we practice our exercises, we know what our solutions are supposed to look like ahead of time just to streamline the process. Um, so it's value in that. And there's also value for a lot of people in seeing what it really, really looks like, you know. So there's a lot of journeys that you could um, or a lot of avenues you could to potentially explore. Now, um, if you like, um, if you like short videos, long videos, short articles, long articles, if you like books, um, and I would say for me, back when I was first learning, my things was YouTube. I used Treehouse, which is teamtreehouse.com. And I was a member of Girl Develop It. So even before I became a leader, I used to TA and take classes. So as a TA, I could take classes for free. So I would TA first for classes and then I would trade off and actually go and attend like Java classes that I was interested in. So those were my three main resources that I learned from. Um, and then in addition to that, I had 
like that those were my resources when I was in a boot camp. So even when I was in a full time program, I had an instructor, we had labs and a TA and all that. When I would go home, I still watched YouTube videos. I still went on to a online platform, which was Treehouse and actually followed their online courses and built um, projects across the same concepts that I was learning in my program. Um, and then I had Girl Develop It. So that gave me another avenue of live teaching. But Girl Develop It really also gave me another avenue of reinforcing my knowledge because I was a TA. So not only was I learning about new topics, but I was um, helping to other people learn about topics that I was already familiar with. And that helped me really know that I understood the material and I was grasping things over time. So um, those are, those, to me, those those are, are crucial. And then I'll say there's other avenues now, right? Like we have podcasts, um, for example, and even with podcasts, you got you got podcasts that can be very specific, very technical, and walking you through different topics. Um, you also have podcasts that can be, you know, talking more from like the news and industry. Um, you have shows like this where I can be talking to you more about like advice and opportunities and people can uh, share their experiences. So just depending on whatever you're looking for, you can pretty much kind of come up with your secret sauce of what are the different resources that works best for you. And explore different resources because you might find that something that like you might be watching this one person on YouTube, right? And maybe every time they're explaining that you never know what they're talking about. But re ex expand out and look at other creators, look at other um, sources of information, because when you find that one that clicks for you, it makes things so much simpler. That's how I felt when I found Treehouse, because I literally, I think I, I had my Treehouse account almost 10 years. I just stopped. I just stopped keeping my subscription up like maybe a year ago, maybe a year ago. Um, and that's only because I wasn't actively using it anymore and it had been a while. But I really, Treehouse was it for me. For me, it was like they had the languages, they had the, the tools that I needed to learn. Um, I loved how the material was structured. I love how the projects were structured. Um, I loved how the instructors presented the material. I love the pacing. That was just like when I when I finally found that one, I was like, yes, this this is this is what I've been looking for. But that doesn't make that the platform for everybody, right? Just find something that works for you. So explore around, um, check into blogs and things like that. Um, find different different uh, courses that can be helpful and supplemental um, and help you piece to, that you can piece together along the way. Um, yeah, so that's eight things. It's almost like 45 minutes of me just talking. So um, I am going to go ahead and start to wrap it up here. But I have a few more things to talk about just with some upcoming events and other opportunities where you can learn more about a lot of these different topics that I'm talking about. And so um, I want to give some announcements here. So for Girl Develop It, we do have upcoming classes, and I wanted to mention that uh, for code or for May, the code is May 50, May 50, you can get 50% off for our May classes. So, for example, JavaScript Fundamentals Part 2, that's um, if you want to know about ES6 and um, more advanced features of JavaScript. That class is going to be starting soon, right? And so that's a class where um, you can use the promo code to get half off of those classes that are going to be upcoming. But the big event that I want to highlight for everybody is our career explorations event, which is going to be June 6th and 7th. So when it comes to the career exploration event, there's going to be a lot of presenters that are talking about even the topics that I was, you know, mentioning today, but doing deeper dives. So like I mentioned, I will be doing a leveraging Git and GitHub as your tech technical portfolio workshop. Um, so that'll be Git and GitHub. That will be um, how to how to use the different features that you have on GitHub to set up your profile appropriately and also how to launch your personal web page 
through GitHub pages. So I'll be doing that presentation. We also have a virtual networking, how to maximize LinkedIn. And then we have another presentation called Pivot with Purpose, um, tips on navigating your path to a tech career. And that's just a few of the options. So I do want to highlight this for you all just so that you can take a look. Um, if you go to girldevelopit.com, you can uh, find our career exploration event on the schedule. So it's going to be June 6th and 7th. And um, if you are interested in seeing more about the agenda, you can actually go to the page of the event now and see how that agenda is shaping up. So we are have we have a lot of amazing leaders in our community, um, our board members, long time um, teachers and and um, community members that will be giving these different presentations. So I highly encourage you all to take a look at that event, and uh, hopefully we'll see you there. Uh, but yes, I am very excited that we are now. You know, we're episode we're two episodes in. But there's so much more that I have to share with everyone and our community has to share with everyone. So I'm very, very excited about it. I will be uh, launching the, here, let's do this. Uh, go back here. So I will be launching the podcast site for Girl Develop It show, along with the other shows that uh, I am hosting at the time. So I'll be launching those um the podcast sites alongside uh, publishing those to all the audio platforms. So more news to come there. So you all will be able to easily get the show notes and get resources and um, actually see some more uh, long, longer form content for a lot of the different topics that we're talking about. So I'll be excited to share that with you all in our next episode. And in the meantime, thank you. Thank you so much for everyone that joined. I appreciate you all. And I will see you uh, what next month. We'll have a new, we'll have a new episode coming up soon. All right. Take care, everybody.